Hi, welcome back to my design tutorials. In today's tutorial, we talk about rendering products in 2D using Photoshop. Photoshop rendering or 2D rendering in general stands between hand sketches and rendering from a 3D file in a 3D software. The general purpose of Photoshop rendering is to present concepts in higher fidelity than is possible in a hand sketch without having to invest time into creating a very detailed 3D file. Photoshop rendering is commonly used in automotive design and in transportation design in general. And that's mainly because surfacing in these products is so complex that studying the design in 2D instead of 3D is way more efficient in concepting phase. However, I see Photoshop rendering utilized much less in product design. And in this tutorial, I would like to offer a few thoughts why I think it could be a good idea sometimes. So first of all, there are many flavors to Photoshop renderings. They can range from just simply colored line sketches into pretty detailed and photorealistic images. Uh, and today I'm going to show you how to render this kind of action camera in Photoshop. I will start my ideation with hand sketches. I will quickly study the basic shape, visual theme and location of components and details. So when working on a relatively simply shaped object, such as a smartphone or a camera for example, you can't get very far with hand sketches alone. The difference between a good and bad design is done on a much more detailed level. It's a game of millimeters, game of material finishes and manufacturing precision. And that's why you see designers jumping quickly into CAD. The nice thing about Photoshop rendering is that you can combine accuracy of CAD and photorealistic visualization into speed of a sketch. That allows you to study pretty drastic design changes quickly while seeing it with realistic materials and details during the process. Because you can actually render with accurate dimensions, you can study design concepts based on real existing component dimensions. This makes it also much easier to jump into CAD because you've already got your dimensions and proportions right. I focus on side view or rather front view rendering in this tutorial. It makes rendering significantly faster and it makes it easier to maintain dimensional accuracy. Usually with simple box-like objects, you don't really have to render it in perspective view. When you're happy with your 2D views, you can just go into CAD. So I'm going to start by creating a basic shape of my object in Photoshop. This shape is a rounded rectangle, so I'm just going to go ahead and use the rounded rectangle tool in Photoshop. Next, I'm going to draw the outlines of the other main components, such as the camera and display. I start with the camera and I also use guides uh, as an aid to position my details exactly where I want them to be. The display is going to be a rounded rectangle too, uh, so I'm gonna adjust the corners to match the corners of my main shape. In rounded rectangle tool it's really easy to try different kind of corner radiuses and see what looks best. Now in my previous tutorial I talked about not using true radiuses for corners in this kind of object. However, here when this is only for illustration purposes and these paths are never going to be used for anything 3D, it doesn't really matter as long as it looks good. Okay, so next I create the basic background for my rendering. I'm just going to use a light studio background and I create by using gradient tool. So this next step is really important for creating a realistic looking 3D appearance. I'm essentially creating multiple layers with gradients to different directions to define a 3D shape. So at this stage you have to decide what's the direction of your light. And by adjusting the relative size of these shapes and the sharpness of the edges, I can define the 3D shape. At this stage I always prefer working with sort of neutral 50% gray instead of using color or instead of using uh, a very dark or very light tone. I also use sort of satin finish instead of extremely matte or extremely glossy finish. And the reason for this is just that it gives me really good control over light and shadow. I find it easier to do it like this and then go later on to add color or adjust the glossiness or surface roughness. So I have three layers here that I use to define the roundness of my corners. As you can see, they essentially have black and white gradient fill uh, that goes the opposite directions for each layer. And that's really what creates the 3D effect. So you have surfaces 
that are catching light from different directions as well as surfaces that are catching shadows. And then the fourth layer here is going to be my actual face surface. And this I'm going to first color with solid tone and then I'm going to darken and lighten it a little bit. Then I move to draw my camera detail. So I basically use the same principle that I just used for this main shape. Before going further with these gradient shapes, um, I'm going to add the actual camera detail here. For details like these, where there is easily available uh, high quality images that are not really critical to this uh, certain detail, such as camera lenses or displays, um, I'm just going to go ahead and use an existing photograph or high quality illustration. Details like these really help to create that feeling of photorealism into these renderings. So it has kind of crazy colors at this point, but I'm just gonna worry about adjusting all the colors and darkness and lightness levels later on. So next I create the camera bezel or camera pump uh, using these round shapes uh, with gradients. This lens will have sort of a flat uh, top glass So I'm drawing a dark lens and then I'm adding a light reflection there. Now I really enjoy this face in Photoshop rendering because you can study so drastic differences in design pretty easily. I can resize these elements and I can try different kind of uh, softnesses in transition points more or less endlessly. So here I just had to trim a little bit of that excess blur from my uh, camera bump. Next I'm going to create the front facing display. Again I'm just gonna use a real photograph and I'm gonna match it to my uh, display shape. I've decided that I want the bottom part of my camera to be one big solid surface uh, together with this display area. So I've merged those shapes that create my basic shape and I'm going to cut it half and make a new layer out of it. And now I use level adjustment uh, to basically make it both darker and also make it appear more glossy. And to make it appear more glossy uh, I will go ahead and add an additional reflection. I do that by creating a white layer uh, that I cut uh, to a desired shape and then I adjust its opacity. Next I'm going to create perforation for the microphone. There are multiple ways to do this, uh, but in this example I'm going to use a type tool to essentially just make a lot of dots. Anybody who's ever created perforation patterns in 3D software will know that it's a pain. Again, this is a really nice way to study different perforation patterns uh, very, very quickly and a very realistic uh, visualization. Next, I'm going to add the logo. So before defining the surface texture and color for my top part, I still have a chance to do some pretty drastic design studies uh, like changing the location or size of my camera element. Now I adjust the darkness of the top part of my housing. 
and I want it to have uh, a lightly textured surface. So I'm gonna use a noise command uh, to create that surface. Again, the nice thing in Photoshop is that you can really quickly study whether you want your logo to be embossed or debossed, uh, to be out of metal or, or pad printed on the surface. So as you can see, it's pretty easy to add the color later on. Now this thing is getting ready and it's time to do the final adjustments. So basically just go around the whole design and add parting lines and other details as well as adjust the colors and surface finishes. Then I'm going to create a drop shadow. So I draw a basic shape and then I use both uh, motion blur and Gaussian blur to create the shadow. When I recolor the product, it altered some of the lights and shadows around the corners. So I have to go and adjust them a little bit uh, at this stage. So the last thing I want to show here is how easy it is to study variations once you are done with your basic design. So in this case I just create another color skew. Hey thank you so much for watching this tutorial. If you found it useful please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Thanks, bye!